<laughs> Welcome to session five of electronic structure theory. This is a brief session that deals with one of the, the necessary evils, if you will, of this, of this uh, topic. The basis functions that we talked about in session four, the Gaussian and, and Slater basis functions, they've developed over the years into very, very carefully designed and um, optimized objects that people have tabulated for us. And in, in so doing, they've also assigned certain nomenclature to these basis functions. STO3G, 631G, 631G star, augmented correlation consistent polarized valence double zeta basis. And all this notation has some physical meaning and importance. And in this brief session five, what I'll explain to you basically is what all this jargon and terminology means and what it means not just uh, in terms of what the words mean, but physically in terms of what the particular words are trying to embody in the choice of these basis functions. What are they trying to do for you in treating the electron motions in, in our atom or our molecule? So that's what session five is going to be about. Welcome to session number five. In this session, most of what I'll talk about for most of the time is notations on atomic orbital basis sets which I find, frankly, a little bit boring, but it's necessary to go through it because there's, there's some terminology that's just, it has some physical content um, that's useful to be aware of. So, for example, you've seen things like these augmented correlation consistent polarized valence, triple zeta, et cetera, notations. And I'm trying to now lead you through what, to, what do these things, various notations mean. Well, first of all, <laughs> the part that's the valence triple zeta, VTZ up there, VDZ or VQZ, what that means is that you're treating the valence orbitals. So if you're a carbon atom, you would be treating the 2s and 2p regions of space at the double, triple, quadruple, or if you wrote V5z, valence 5 zeta level. So you would have that level of treatment of the, um, of the valence orbitals. In most of these basis sets of this notation, the core orbitals, that is in the case of carbon, the 1s, is actually not even mentioned here because it's treated as a, a single contracted Gaussian basis function. That is, it's a combination of several Gauss Gaussian basis functions of tightness, looser, 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 but all pretty tight to try as best as they can to represent this really tight 1s cusp behavior of the 1s orbital. So a lot of effort is devoted mainly to the valence space here because most of chemistry is valence space things. So this notation, that part of it is telling you what is done for the, essentially the uh, core, it's not even mentioned, it's a, a single contracted Gaussian function, and the conventional valence basis functions. That's the VDZ, VTZ, so forth. The correlation is consistent, the CC there, that means correlation consistent. And what that means is that the uh, contracted basis functions, the contraction coefficients of these 1s orbitals, and the orbital exponents of the s, the tight s, and the looser s and looser p functions, the orbital exponents have been varied and optimized, that is varied so that the energies that are calculated at a correlated level, that is not Hartree-Fock, but at some level beyond that, MP2, MP3, or coupled cluster, agree pretty well with the experimental data. So the sort of uh, tuning of the basis set was done by trying to make the calculations on the isolated atoms that these basis functions are, are tabulated for in good agreement with the energy level spacings of the like triplet P, singlet S, singlet D, ionization potentials and so forth of the isolated atoms when the calculation is done at the um, correlated level, CC. If the CC is missing, then the basis functions have usually been optimized, their or orbital exponents, in other words, chosen and tuned so that the Hartree-Fock level treatment of the atom energy levels agrees pretty well with the experimental uh, spacings. Um, P, the PVTZ, PVQZ, so forth, the P that's there means that polarization basis orbitals have, have also been added to the uh, basis set. Now the number in, in these particular kind of basis functions that you find that are called Dunning, because Tom Dunning was the primary mover in developing this particular kind of basis set, these augmented and non-augmented, I haven't yet told you what augmented means, correlation, consistent, polarized, valence, blah, blah, blah. Uh, those <laughs> basis functions, when the polarization functions are added, they have a very specific way of adding the polarization functions. So, for example, at the, um, 
if you, let's, let's just treat this carbon as an example. If you're doing a valence double zeta, so that means you have two valence S type functions and two sets of valence P type functions as far as your normal valence space, and you have a P out in front of it, then you've added one set of depolarization functions. Alternatively, if you have a valence triple zeta treatment of the valence space, so you have three S and three sets of P functions, they will differ in their radial sizes. Then what, the, what Dunning does is when he says P for the polarization, they don't just add D functions, they also add F functions. They add two sets of Ds and one set of F. So they're adding more polarization functions for the triple zeta than for the double zeta. Why do they do that? Because when you have a double zeta basis set, the way to think of it is that radially you have sort of one shell that is your tighter 2S and 2P functions, and then another layer that is your looser 2S and 2P functions, so you have more radial volume. And so what they're doing is because you have more volume radially, you, you're, they're trying to carve out more angular uh, chopping up of that volume. So they, that's why they add more Ds and more F functions, so you're having more angular chopping up of this space. So you're giving yourself more radial space when you go to triple zeta than double zeta, and therefore you want to have more angular flexibility also. That's the, f the philosophy behind doing this. So, and of course, the, at the five zeta level, they would add just not D functions, but F functions and G functions and H functions. So as you can see, when you go in these kind of basis sets, when you go to higher uh, this cardinal number, as they call it, five or four or three for triple or two for or double, you're going to get in trouble if you have these polarization functions because they're going to have lots of them. And remember, things scale as the fourth power of the number of basis functions you have. Okay, so that's, that's one of the tricky things about those basis sets is that they have this um, very unique way of adding polarization functions. Now, they say this word aug, augmented, and what that means is that you've added to your basis set also some conventional, you know, not these super diffuse Rydberg things, but just out of the basis set library of diffuse basis functions, you've added some, um, basis, some uh, diffuse basis functions. So that's what the word augmented means. Now there's another world of notation rather than these Dunning worlds, which is the like polarization, augmented polarization, correlation consistent. There's the Popel world notation that's derived from the kind of basis functions that the John Popel's group developed over the years. And they have notations like 631G star star or 6311 plus G star. So I gotta explain what does all that mean. Well, first of all, the thing in the front, the six or the three or the six or the six here, what that means is that in the um, core orbitals, there's got, there are either three or six primitive Gaussians that have been added together to give the contracted core orbital. So for example, when there's six, that means that there were six Gaussian S functions of tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter radial character that have been combined, contracted, to try to form a tight Slater looking 1s function. So that, the, that's what the initial number means there. And then the number 31 or 21 or 311, what does that mean? Well, for example, the 21 means that in the valence space, there are two, that's why there, there's two numbers there. So in 31, there's also two um, S and P functions if you're carbon. But what's different is that in 21, the first S and also the first P function are a combination of two primitive Gaussians. So in other words, in the valence space, the first S function is actually a combination of two or three primitive functions. And then the second basis function is actually a combination of one function, so it's by itself. So for example, in the 3-1 case, we would have the S function is a combination of three primitive Gaussian S's to give a single uh, prim, uh, contracted Gaussian S. And then the next S out in the double zeta level treatment that we have here is by itself. That is, it's not a combination of Gaussians, it's just an independent Gaussian. So that's what those things mean. In, the, in this case, for example, of 311, so for example, up here we have six. That means that in the core, there are six uh, primitive Gaussians contracted to a tight S function. 
And then the 311 means at the valence level, we're treating this as triple zeta. The first function is a combination of three primitive functions to give a single Gaussian, both S and P for carbon. The next function out is, let's say, radially more extended, and it's by itself. And then the third function out, because there's three of them, three, one, one, the third function out is also by itself. It's so-called uncontracted Gaussian. Okay, and then there's a notation here of what does the stars and pluses mean? The star means that polarization functions have been added to what sometimes we call the heavy atoms, the non-hydrogenic atoms. So that would mean that if we had a star in our basis set, we would be adding polarization functions to carbons and nitrogens and oxygens, fluorines. But if the basis notation has, which I haven't indicated, oh, there's one. If we have a basis uh, notation that's star star, that means you've added polarization functions to the heavy atoms and to the hydrogen atoms. So you have on your hydrogen atoms, you have tight p functions that are the size of the 1s orbital. And then the plus <laughs> means that a single set of conventional diffuse basis functions have been added. You know, so these diffuse functions, like the kind that you could look up in the PNL basis library, one set of, in the case of carbon, it would be s and p valence uh, basis functions that are more diffuse have been added. If there's uh, plus plus, it means that two sets of those, you know, so one set that's diffuse and then another set that's a little bit more diffuse even than that. Now the problem was it, with all this is you say, well, I know what basis I'm going to use. I'm going to use the biggest one. <laughs> and the problem with that is you got to keep in mind, please, that whenever you're doing the calculations, the number of these two electron integrals, which scales as m to the fourth, will kill you. When you, if you double the number of basis functions, 2, 4, 8, 6, you 16-fold increase the amount of time and perhaps storage if these things have to be stored on disk. So the number of basis functions you want to use, really, you want to try to get away with as small a basis as you can. And people have spent a long, long time trying to develop these either Popel-based or Dunning-based basis sets. So the, but the thing that you want to memorize is that your two electron integrals, scale is m to the fourth, taking your Hartree-Fock matrix and then finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which have to be done on every iteration of the SCF process, they scale, that time scales as the third power of the number of basis functions. You say, well, is the worst case scenario then m to the fourth, Jack? No, because coming down the pike when we start to do correlated calculations beyond Hartree-Fock, things are going to get into m to the fifth and higher. So that's even going to be more miserable. Now, let me just, I want to have us just make friends here a little bit with, I want to make sure that you're, you're understanding these polarization functions uh, having the same radial size as the valence functions that they try to, um, to polarize, if you will. So what we have here is some the radial um, densities, radial plots for the functions that are for correlation consistent, polarized, valence, quadruple, zeta basis set. So for example, here, are the 2s and 2p functions. So in the quadruple zeta, you see there's a 1, 2, 3, 4, that's quadruple zeta. The, the core orbital there, the 1s, isn't even shown. It's tighter than anything here. So there's four valence ranged s functions. There's also 1, 2, 3, 4 valence range p functions. So all these are just the valence quadruple zeta. That's that component. But then because we put polarization functions in, and it's quadruple zeta, we've put, in quadruple, we've put in polarization D, F, and G functions of weird angular shape, you know, D shape, F shape, G shape. But notice that the radial size of these Ds lies in the same space as the S's and P's that they try to do stuff with, do the dancing with. And also the F functions are radially in the same space as the S and P's. And the G function, there's only one course of I don't know how many G's there are. Uh, there's, what, seven F's, and therefore there's nine G functions. The nine G functions radially are all the same radially, but they have different angular shape. And their radial character, though, puts them spatially where the S and P functions are. So the whole bunch, there would be 55 basis functions for that one atom there. OK, <laughs> now, one of the most important things about the particular kind of basis sets that Tom Dunning's group has been developing, these so-called polarization uh, 
uh, correlation consistent polarized valence X zeta, you know, like double zeta, triple zeta, quadruple zeta, and so forth. Um, because they have this strategy that any time you increase this so-called cardinal number, this X from double, triple, quadruple, f fivefold, that you add more and more high angular functions to span more and more high angular space, th these people have found that the dependence on, of the correlation energy. Now, remember, when we do a calculation using different methods, there's always going to be Hartree-Fock energy of that method within a given basis set, and then maybe MP2, MP3, MP4, couple cluster, different kinds of correlated methods. But what they found is that if you look at the dependence of the Hartree-Fock energy on the basis set size as labeled by this cardinal number here, I want you to look at this one graph that's right here that says logarithm of the error in the Hartree-Fock energy in milli Hartrees. Now remember a Hartree is 27.21 EVs, so a milli Hartree would be 0.001 Hartree. So on the vertical axis here on this graph on the right is energy in milli Hartrees, and it's really, sorry, it's logarithm of the error. Now, so it's the Hartree-Fock energy error versus X, where X is this cardinal number. So three would be triple zeta. 4 would be quadruple zeta, 5 is 5 zeta, 6 is 6. So they've done calculations and they've seen that the logarithm of this Hartree-Fock error as a function of this cardinal number is linear. And they've done then some theoretical analysis to convince themselves that yes indeed, the Hartree-Fock energy as a function of this cardinal number should uh, scale exponentially as a function of this cardinal number. So this, this should give you some idea that if you were, if you believe this happens in, in all the cases, and it does in the cases they've tested, you therefore could carry out calculations, for example, at double zeta and triple zeta, and maybe then fit to a line and extrapolate, and you could find what the, uh, the Hartree-Fock energy would be in a bigger basis that's infinite zeta. That's, so it's called complete basis extrapolation. But the thing that they also found is that the energy that's not the Hartree-Fock energy, that is the part that's left over after Hartree-Fock, the correlation energy as we call it, tends to scale differently. When they plot that up, logarithm of the error in the correlation energy versus X, they don't get a straight line. But what they do get is a line that's fit to this, that the energy uh, at cardinal num number X equals an exact energy minus some constant times X to the minus three. That is, this graph tends to fit one over x cubed, where x is this double or triple, or you say, well, where does that come from? Well, people actually have carried out theoretical analyses of how those, um, uh, the energies in correlation energy should scale with this cardinal basis set size, and most of the people have done it by, by using perturbation theory, where they know, for example, that in second order perturbation theory, the correlation energy is some two electron integral squared, we'll, we'll see this later, divided by orbital energy. And in, three, in the third order, it's gonna be, it has two electron integrals cubed divided by products of two orbital energies. And in fourth order, it has a certain structure that they know. And by analyzing how these two electron integrals vary with the cardinal uh, number there, they've been able to show analytically that it should be expected that the correlation energy should fit a, uh, linear plot if you plot correlation energy versus um, one over this cardinal number cubed. So to make a long story short, based upon these observations that the Hartree-Fock energy falls off, ex the errors in the Hartree-Fock energy fall off exponentially with um, this cardinal number, and the errors in the correlation energy fall off as one over cardinal number cubed, that has allowed people to develop what are called complete basis set extrapolation methodologies. And basically what they involve, in, and I'll just illustrate it with this one here, if you've carried out a calculation at level X and at level Y, for example, EX would be the correlation energy you calculated at, say, triple zeta, X equal three. And Monika's carried out a calculation at Y at, say, quadruple zeta level, zeta level, Y equals four. Then we can predict the extrapolated energy that would be appropriate for infinite basis set by taking uh, 3 cubed E3 minus 4 cubed E4 divided by 3 cubed minus 4 cubed. You know, this extrapolation sort of derives from the fact that you observe that things fall off as 1 over that cardinal number cubed. And likewise, 
you can carry out calculations at a couple of different values of this x, you know, double zeta or triple zeta, and fit the Hartree-Fock energy to this form and extrapolate it down to x equal infinity to predict what would be the Hartree-Fock energy at the infinite basis set limit. And just to give an example, because I think you say, this is too good to be true, Jack. Because if it were really true, we could do a calculation at minimal basis, x equal 1, and double zeta basis, x equal 2, and we could extrapolate and get the right answer. And the, the, tr the truth is, yeah, it's a little bit too good to be true. What people find is if you use, for example, in the correlation energy, double zeta and triple zeta, x equal 2 and 3, to do this extrapolation, you tend to get extrapolated correlation energies that are off by, on average, about 23 millihartries, 0.023 hartries. And you can multiply that by 27.21 EVs to see what that would be. Instead, if you said, I want to use triple zeta and quadruple zeta, because you say, that should be a better extrapolate, x equal 3 and 4, it is indeed. You, you get 5 millihartries. So the higher the level of calculation you can afford to do, the better you are at doing this extrapolation. But at least the kinds of things that you can currently do on computers, double zeta, triple zeta, triple quadruple in some cases, they are actually good enough to give pretty good extrapolated energies. So the bottom line here is that with all these basis sets that people have spent many, many years from back in the 1950s developing, one of the good things in particular about these Dunning bases is when you use them, you can carry out these Hartree-Fock extrapolations and correlation energy extrapolations. And in the Gaussian programs, they have this, I think it's called CBS, complete basis set, keyword that can be used to carry out these extrapolations. And that's, that's a pretty powerful thing. So that's the end of that one. So that was a nice short one.